Welcome everyone. Am I live, Jim? Well, I think I am now live. So uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the uh, 101 track for uh, cloud. And our first presentation as, as part of this introductory 101 track uh, will be uh, Kubernetes, the final frontier. And if you're a Trekkie like myself, I'm sure you're going to be excited. So uh, with that said, let me turn this over to Amanda, who will be presenting uh, this um, tutorial. Take it away. Kubernetes, the final frontier. This is an introduction to Kubernetes tutorial. The continuing mission to explore the strange new worlds of microservices, containerization, and their management. To seek out new skills and new adventures. To boldly go where no one has gone before. Uh, so happy you're here to join me uh, to learn more uh, in this tutorial uh, and for being here at Open Source Summit. This is my first time at Open Source Summit. I'm super excited. I'm super excited to be uh, doing this tutorial with you all and especially around Kubernetes. So, but with a little bit more about what we're going to be actually talking about, we're going to be doing Kubernetes, the final frontier. Uh, and I'm Amanda Moran. And uh, you can also follow, follow me there on my Twitter. And so we're going to come to our next slide. And it's actually going to be a video I would just like to uh, share with you all to get us all excited, all on the same page, and uh, excited about learning about Kubernetes. Kubernetes, the final frontier. This is an introduction to Kubernetes tutorial. The continuing mission to explore the strange new worlds of microservices, containerization, and their management. To seek out new skills and new adventures. To boldly go where no one has gone before. All right, awesome. I hope you all got as jazzed up by that as I did. Um, I just love hearing that song. Not so much me narrating, but I love that song. All right, so let's get into it. Enough fun and games, uh, but I hope we do have uh, a lot of fun learning today. Uh, so this is the agenda for our tutorial. Uh, we're gonna do what is Kubernetes, right? So this is a very you know introduction to Kubernetes, so we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about why it's so popular uh, we're going to also learn about uh, why uh, why this should be of interest to you. Uh, if you're not, you know, a Kubernetes developer right now, uh, I mean, obviously it's important to them, but why should it be important to you if maybe you do, you know, you're a developer, you're in, you know, machine learning, data science, uh, DevOps, why should you want to learn about it? Then we're going to go over the uh, architecture of Kubernetes. We're going to talk about what is a pod and what is a deployment. Then we're gonna get into the hands-on tutorial portion. Uh, we're gonna have a little bit of time to install Minikube. Um, that's what we're gonna be using because that's what you can install right on your laptop. Uh, and then we can just jump in and start you know, with the hands-on tutorial. So Minikube is really awesome for that. We're gonna deploy a simple web application. We're gonna deploy, um, oh, 
let, we're going to deploy a simple application. Then we're going to deploy uh, another simple web application. We're going to learn a little bit about high availability and scalability. And I'm going to kind of point you to some resources where you can learn more after this, because, you know, we only have this limited amount of time together. So you're not going to be able to learn everything. So where to go next to learn more. So just a little bit about me, just to introduce myself to you all. Like I said, I'm Amanda. So I'm a Bay Area based software engineer slash solutions architect. I like to think of myself. I'm really both. And uh, I love working with customers and, and helping them on their journey with whichever distributed system that they're, you know, that they're using, be it Kubernetes, be it something like Apache Cassandra, Apache Spark. That's where I really uh, I'm really passionate about helping helping folks get onboarded with different technologies. So, like I said, I have a background in uh, doing helping customers with machine learning, analytics, different various different distributed systems. I've worked at a variety of companies, uh, both big and small. I've worked for companies like HP and Teradata, very big companies, and I've worked for a 30-person startup on day one. So I've kind of ran, uh, and also some other uh, smaller mid-sized startups as well. I'm actually an Apache committer and a PMC member for Apache Trifodian, which is a SQL on HBase uh, a solution, a way to query HBase via SQL. But what do I love, other than my passions around helping customers uh, and training and tutorials and doing things like this. Well, I love dogs. I have a corgi. I love Disneyland. I love veggies. I love teaching and training and helping others. And I love running and exercise. So hopefully now you learn a little bit about me and how my kind of qualifications to be teaching you all in this course. Okay, so another thing I wanted to mention uh, before we kick off, there's one other element. We're gonna kind of take some time to install Minikube together, um, but uh, before that, you need to have uh, install a hypervisor. So um, I'm not going to take any like break time for us to do this. So you can just kind of be kicking this off in the background um, while I'm talking um, or, you know, future future times you're watching this video, you could pause it and then go do that and then unpause or however it's going to work. Um, but yes, you need a hypervisor if you don't already have one installed. Uh, personally, I use uh, VirtualBox. It's just the one I'm most familiar with, the easiest one to get just like up and running. So it's uh, normally like just two minutes. It gives folks the ability uh, to kick off the download. Um, so, you know, just just go ahead and take that time now. Just kick it off and, you know, um, we'll get we'll get going. And like I said, we'll we're going to install Minikube as well, which uses VirtualBox. Um, so if you already have VirtualBox installed or VMware or something like that, you could go ahead and install Minikube now as well. So however that works for you, but you're going to need both but I will give time for Minikube later. Okay, so I'll give like 20 seconds while everyone's over there frantically clicking around trying to get that. So let's give just a tiny bit of time before I start my lecture here. So I do want us to be able to walk through the tutorial together. Okay, so I'm gonna imagine that you've all frantically gone over to VirtualBox, you've accepted all the agreements and now it's properly downloading. Okay, great. So what is Kubernetes? So Kubernetes, uh, normally uh, abbreviated as K8s, uh, is an open source system for automatically deploying, scaling, and management of containerized applications. So it was donated to the CNCF Foundation by Google and has been developed and used at Google for over 15 years. So it was first released in June 2014 and is now around six years old. So Kubernetes is actually uh, a child of a massive project that um, that they actually had at Google called Borg, which kind of gives uh, a little understanding of the theming here of why we went why I went with Star Trek um, for this tutorial since the original name was Borg. So Borg was very specific to Google, and and so it couldn't really be open sourced um, all on its own. They couldn't just take Borg and just open source it. Um, because they just had too many specifics there. So a team of engineers actually worked on removing all the Google uh, specifics and created uh, Kubernetes, which they then donated to the Linux Foundation and, and helped to create actually the CNCF, the Cloud Native and Cloud Foundry organization within the Linux Foundation. So um, that's basically taking it from, you know, something very proprietary specific to um, Google and then actually, de you know, de developing a team that would then take that and open source it uh, really gives us this amazing technology that we have today that we can utilize. 
So what are some of the, the benefits of Kubernetes, right? So, you know, we kind of went over the high level, right? But, you know, what are kind of the benefits? So you can run applications anywhere, as long as you have Kubernetes installed, of course. So there's easy cluster management. It has service discovery and load balancing, storage management, automated rollouts and rollbacks. Actually, I was just doing uh, another tutorial a couple of days ago where I got to see the power of using those automated rollouts and rollbacks. And uh, it, it really impressed me. A lot of things about Kubernetes really impressed me. Uh, but the ability to do those rollbacks so easily, uh, I was I was kind of floored. Uh, so I've worked with, like I said, a lot of different systems. Uh, I've worked especially with Apache Drifodian on installs and upgrades for customers. And, you know, they could just, you know, sometimes it could just be a nightmare. Uh, you know, you could get stuck in the middle of an upgrade and it didn't quite work. And then you're in this bad middle state. And but with Kubernetes, it has this ability to roll back uh, just with basically one command. And it's it's very easy. So um, I'm not going to be able to demo any of that to you today, but I, just a, a word of something that I was super impressed with. Um, it has automatic bin packing. So placing the containers uh, by their resources. So, right, it's able to schedule out and figure which nodes uh, in your cluster have the ability to take on this particular resource or container, you know, by the size or the uh, amount of quota that it needs, things like that. Uh, it's self-healing and it's very easy to horizontally scale. So we only have a short amount of time together today. Uh, so I'd love to demo for you and how they can be uh, show you the ease in which we can create deployments and do self healing and scalability. So we'll kind of see that uh, over the course of our tutorial. So at the very least, we, I can demo those and we can work together on those uh, to see those. All right, so let's start talking about why Kubernetes is so popular. So companies are really moving away from monolithic applications. So you've probably heard that term quite a bit, you know, microservices, monolithic, right? And so let's just kind of dive into just a little bit of what the difference between the two are. So on your left, uh, you see the architecture really of the past uh, that we're really used to seeing, right? Large monolithic applications really take years to develop uh, with large teams of experts. Hours to build, not just like to, to build, like to code up. I mean, that takes years, right? But just to build the actual process, you know, you've made a very simple, simple change to just one little component and then you have to kick off a build and it may possibly take you, you know, two or three hours before you even get that build that then you can then, you know, take and then go to test, right? Um, so, it's not really easy to make quick and easy changes, right? Because you do have to spend all this time building this very large monolith. Not to mention a lot of times it's it's very hard to make changes because things are scattered all throughout the code. You don't have those very clear, sometimes you have clear, nice components uh, that kind of mi mimic microservices. Other times you don't. Um, so, uh, but what we're seeing here on the right-hand side is kind of the architecture that we're going towards now and, and more so in the future. Um, so you see just a really simple example of a microservices application. Uh, so it's really easy to make changes um, to this architecture because as you can see, right, um, you're just gonna, if you have one simple change to one service, you're able to change that and then uh, build just that one service and then deploy that. And then uh, that's all you have to do, right? So it really makes it easier. So when all these these uh, services are broken out from these monoliths into these microservices, it's much easier to test, to change, and to package. So, and it's much easier, as you can see here, uh, just in this simple architecture drawing, it's so much easier to scale out as well. Um, so you can scale out the services that you actually need to scale out and, and not have to scale out, you know, um, in a complicated way. It's very simple. All right. So let's just talk a little bit more about why uh, using microservices is something that you may want to consider for your application. So with um, a microservice is essentially like we've talked about a service that just does a single task and that's really all it does. Um, 
So because of that, you can really have rapid development, especially on those services, right? You know, your whole application as a whole, it's going to help uh, rapidly develop it, that application as you spread out that work among different people who are dedicated to those different microservices, right? You have the ability to swap out components of an architecture with ease. We kind of talked about that a bit uh, before. Uh, it's easier to automate CI CD pipelines because of this, again, because the, the build process, that test process is much simpler uh, when you can just simply make a small change and, and just build and test that. And it gives you a lot of flexibility and ease to change course. So for me, a, a prime example of that is it's really easy to, to swap out components. So say you have a web application that connects to a database. Um, so with a monolith, um, what if you want to try a new database uh, for this application? So with using microservices, you can easily change the, you know, the driver and the API in one of your microservices that makes that call to the database and you'll be able to connect to the database service. That's really, it's really all that you need to do. And you're pretty much good to go. Um, you're not going to have to grep through all of the code in this huge monolithic repo uh, to try to figure out which places the application actually connects to the database and where it does a write, where it does an insert, right? With microservices, it's very clear which services do what and what, where you need to change. So you can kind of hear from my voice that I may have had to do that from time to time where I'm just grepping through this giant code base, just trying to find, you know, where are these connections to the database? But with microservices architecture, you, you know, that will greatly be reduced. Um, so microservices are also very easy to containerize. So like with a containerization service like Docker uh, or ContainerD, et cetera. And so Kubernetes is really the best place to manage those containers. So it's kind of been uh, the winner of that to anything that you containerize with either Docker or the other containerization services you want to run that on Kubernetes um, and not manage those containers yourself. This gives you the platform to do that. So uh, again, why is, uh, why is Kubernetes so popular? So there's many ways to install and run. So um, you can manage your own Kubernetes cluster or you can actually use, uh, One second here. Slight technical difficulty. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so you can, there's multiple different ways to install and run your Kubernetes cluster. You can manage your own Kubernetes cluster, or you can use many of the cloud offerings. Um, the first Kubernetes tutorial that I actually did uh, with Udacity, um, which actually I link you here in the um, the, the slide notes. Uh, so when you get the slides, you'll see these in the slide notes, uh, the course from Udacity that I took on um, microservices and Kubernetes. It's actually, um, they used uh, Google Cloud uh, EKS to do the tutorial. And within minutes, I had a usable Kubernetes cluster uh, where I could start deploying my application uh, and my pods. Uh, we're gonna see basically the same with, with Minikube as well. But it's just nice to know that you have either of those options. You can uh, try to do that in the cloud. It's very simple. Or you can install something like Minikube. The difference between Minikube and using something like the cloud is so obviously with the cloud, you can see easily with even just doing your simple testing how you can easily deploy that into production. Or with Minikube, there's no prediction with Minikube. You'd have to then take what you've built and then move it off into I mean, either your cloud provider or a bare metal um, managed Kubernetes you know, that you have there at wherever you're at, your company. Um, so, so Kubernetes, um, has like as a project has a, uh, a three month, uh, release cycle. So now I'm not quite sure of the release cycle on those cloud providers. I, I'm not quite sure how quickly they pick up, uh, the latest version of Kubernetes. So I, I actually don't know which versions of Kubernetes that those different cloud providers are on. So that's something that you'd want to investigate. Um, so if you need to use a particular version of Kubernetes or you want to be on the latest and greatest, uh, you you'd want to check with the cloud provider that you're using um, to make sure that it you know aligns with what you need. Um, and so also, um, let's see. 
yeah, but honestly, like just investigate that and, and that'll help from there. All right, so Kubernetes, again, why it's so popular. Kubernetes has a very active and supportive community. So there's many different uh, companies Many different companies contribute uh, to the project. So it's not just, so even though it was uh, open source and donated by Google, Google is not the only uh, contributor to the project or, or, or even uh, the main contributor, I think, anymore because there's so many companies that are contributing. And you can just kind of see from this GitHub here, the popularity of this project. So you can see from the GitHub status that, um, and see how active the project is. So there's over 25,000 contributors 2,500 contributors, sorry, <laughs> um, 2,500 contributors. So that's just really impressive for a project, you know, an open source project like this. Um, and also shows um, what if, uh, you know, an inclusive community as well. The fact that you have so many different companies and other people just coming in, um, you know, contributing to this open source project. So everyone is really um, welcome to contribute and, and uh, collaborate. Um, within this environment. And so um, even just folks coming in who wanna learn more and you know do some help, you know, like do a code review, do a code review um, test or, or anything like that, you know, it, it's really welcome. And, and then you're able to be mentored by, you know, a team of experts, of these expert Kubernetes folks that are, are here in this community. So it's really a, a great opportunity to learn and contribute and, you know, honestly, even get a little bit of mentorship through this process. So there's also special interest groups that meet uh, regularly. I think they meet either weekly or bi-weekly, uh, where if you know there's something very uh, interesting to you uh, in this community, you know you can meet up and and talk it over with other folks from other uh, other companies and etc. There's also you know different meetups and conferences. So it's a very active community where there's just a lot of learning to be had. All right. So why should I learn about Kubernetes? So if you work in DevOps or, or infrastructure, this is really a no brainer, right? And um, this is definitely, you know, it, this is moving towards the future. Um, this is something, a platform that you're definitely going to, whether you're going to have to manage it, uh, you know, directly, um, that's a possibility. Also just, uh, it may be something that you have to connect to, you know, from another system and things like that. And you have to be aware of, of you know, the different things that uh, need to be uh, considered when doing that. Um, so honestly, this is something that you definitely want to, 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 to start learning about, you know, especially if you're in this space, right? It's a very uh, popular and new technology. Um, so that's always, you know, gets people really excited, right? It's, it's nice for the resume, right? Uh, but what about like developers and data scientists, right? So you may be thinking, you know, infrastructure and deploying of infrastructures and containers. That's not, you know, that's not really what, uh, you know, that's not what I do, right? I, I build machine models. That's what I do. But honestly, the infrastructure will affect how you build and use uh, your applications, right? So there's going to be some things that you have to, you know, make some consideration uh, because of when you move, you know, using something like Kubernetes, because it will affect how you build, uh, build your models, right? So for example, with storage, um, you know, if you are building something or using something, expecting that you're going to have persistent storage, or that this container will always be up and live. And so I can just store, you know, information locally, um, Etc. You know, with Kubernetes, that that you know, this is um, it may not be the case. The container can come up and then it could die, and then if you had just written to local storage, that's all wiped clean once that container is gone. So you know, you may want to think about um, you know saving off to persistent store things like that. It's just things that you have to keep in mind that uh, you wouldn't uh, normally right if you weren't using Kubernetes. So also doing any like, you know, hard coding of values or hard coding of paths. Those may be things that you want to, you know, keep in mind. Uh, also, like I said, because your containers are not persistent necessarily, um, you know, if you're bringing in a new package um, with that container that you're currently working with, that's fine uh, to help build your models. But, you know, if, the, if that container dies and then another one comes up, it's not going to have that package. So if you start running something depending on that, that may be a problem. 
So, um, so those are just a few words of, you know, just to like, just get you, uh, understanding that if, um, even if your job doesn't revolve around Kubernetes, but the platform that you're using is Kubernetes based, just maybe some, just few things that you need to keep in mind and consider. And I think this class is going to help you to do that. So now remember, this is uh, just an introduction. So there's so much more to learn. So we're just be touching on a few high level topics and doing some hands on exploration. Uh, then the best way to learn, honestly, is by doing. But we will have a little bit of lecture here. So let's start diving into uh, the Kubernetes architecture. So just a little bit of terminology. So first, uh, we're going to talk about the control plane. So the control plane has the cube API server, the cube controller manager, the cube scheduler, a cloud control manager, and etcd, which is a key value database. And then the node has a kubelet, cube proxy, and a container runtime. So here's just a nice uh, graphic of the Kubernetes architecture. It kind of gives you an idea of just those different services that we just discussed. discussed. So um, like I mentioned before, um, I do have a background in distributed systems. And me personally, it's mostly in databases. So for me, the terminology um, that I'm used to, um, like for me, you know, if I come to a new database that I haven't worked with before, I'm, you know, even though there may be new terminology, it's really easy for me to just like get caught up and like understand, okay, that relates to that and this relates to that. Uh, so for me personally, Kubernetes was a whole new world uh, of like new terminology. So for, for me, honestly, it was a little bit daunting at first to kind of understand this terminology. Um, but if you're kind of feeling that way, don't get discouraged. The more you surround yourself uh, with the, tr the, the the technology and the community, it gets so much easier. And, and the terminology really starts to just, uh, you know, it all makes sense, honestly. And, and the more you learn about it, which you will hear, you'll figure out that these, um, the terminology is actually very self-descriptive. Um, so they have very distinct names. So we're lucky in that. So, um, so like I said, first, we're going to discuss the architecture of uh, Kubernetes and the elements that are going to matter to you in bringing up your own uh, Kubernetes cluster, especially if you're in DevOps. So that's all around the control plane. Uh, users of you know the Kubernetes clusters don't really touch the control plane as much other than the workflow that I'll kind of show you uh, here in just a minute. So like I said, it's broken into two large pieces that we're seeing here. The green is the control plane and then the individual nodes. So we're going to just go kind of on the basics of each one. So uh, this is a really nice graphic, like I mentioned, that I found on Wikipedia. So each cluster is going to have one or more uh, nodes, probably anywhere from 10 to 100 to thousands of nodes. Um, and then also the control plane is made up of, of, of many nodes as well. Could be anywhere from you know 3 to 10 or anything of that nature. Um, so those nodes also is where the containers are going to run. Um, so your control plane is where it's all being managed. And then your nodes are where uh, your applications and your containers and your deployments and your pods will run. So applications are actually not scheduled on the control plane. Uh, and they're their own separate set of machines. So let's let's dig in a bit to each one of these components. Um, so I like this graphic from, I actually, uh, as you can see in the photo credit, I got this from the Kubernetes documentation because it shows each one of these services and it actually shows them uh, are replicated as well, right? So there's really no single point of failure here, which uh, for me, especially working with distributed systems so long, always kind of, it's something I look out for, right? Because I'm worried about my customers and I want to make sure there's not a single point of failure. Um, so you can also clearly see that in this graphic versus the other one, the etcd, you know, is that key value database and it's that nice cylinder that we're used to when seeing databases in a in a architecture diagram. So, and also here you can you can see how the different services are interacting a little bit more clearly than that other uh, diagram, right? You can see that the API server, it, not here because I kind of cut it off, but you can see it's getting, um, you know, uh, calls from the outside world. It then interacts with the scheduler, the cloud control manager, the cube control manager, and then at CD. So let's dive into each one of those. Um, so first, let's look at the API server. So the API server is essentially responsible for the Kubernetes API.
and it's, it's going to be how you interact with the Kubernetes cluster. So we'll use a command line tool called Kubernetes uh, CTL, or it's sometimes called uh, kubectl. So um, we'll be using kubectl to interact with, uh, with the cluster. And then the Kube API server, as I kind of detailed out before, as you can see in that graphic, and you can kind of see here, but it's really small. It interacts with uh, etcd, the scheduler, and the controllers. So Kube API server is the service that interacts with the outside world. And like I said, it's what we'll be using uh, with, the tube, cube, with the tool kubectl to deploy our pods and application containers. So next, we're going to talk about the Kube controller manager. So it runs multiple controllers, uh, the node controller, the replication controller, the service account, and tokens controller. So it also, uh, it manages the health of the cluster and the status. It communicates with the API server to perform actions on the cluster. So the node controller, for example, keeps an eye on all the nodes in the cluster and reports back their health. So I wanna make sure that, right, if it's going to deploy something somewhere, uh, you know, on node one, that node one is actually alive and healthy, right? The replication controller makes sure all the replicas for the pods um, are all there and up to date. So if you need um, three replicas of something, it's making sure that you have three replicas. Uh, because if maybe a node has gone down and you lost one of your replicas, it's going to make sure that that replica is then uh, booted up on another node. So uh, this uh, controller will actually come in handy uh, in our hands-on lab here in a bit. So um, like I said, this is this is really useful when a node when a node fails. So we won't be able to show uh, the node failing in our lab, uh, but you will be able to, we'll, we'll still, you'll get an idea of it. So I'll, I'll show you in a bit. So service account creates default accounts and an API access tokens for the namespaces. Uh, I don't think we're gonna touch on much around namespaces, but namespaces are basically just a way to uh, kind of organize your Kubernetes cluster and give access to particular uh, people and, and, and users and, and services and accounts and things like that. Um, right. So uh, next is the scheduler. So the scheduler is for scheduling the pods uh, onto the cluster. So the pods, the deployment, the resources onto the cluster. So it's going to figure, you know, figure out essentially what resources are needed. So for your application, uh, it's going to figure out, you know, what does it take to actually run that, you know, be it size, memory, uh, et cetera, and then it's going to schedule based on that. It's also going to base on affinity. So if you have any kind of affinity rules in your in your configuration file, uh, it's going to, you know, if it needs to be a particular label of a particular node, like for example, I have CPU versus GPU. Uh, and so and then I'm going to have a label that says, okay, this needs to be, it's a TensorFlow job, it needs to run on the GPU. So the affinity, the scheduler is going to take that into account and make sure that that pod is scheduled on the correct node. It's also going to help with like making sure the data locality, uh, if you have uh, some data in a particular place and wants to make sure that it's it's going to, you know, schedule you properly for that. Um, so it uses different algorithms uh, to do that configuration to place those nodes. Um, the, so there's a default scheduler. Uh, that does a combination like we talked about of like filtering and scoring and trying to figure this out. You can also write your own scheduler with your own algorithm and you can actually plug that in because Kubernetes, you know, it's very, again, it has that microservices architecture even within itself. You know, you can rewrite things and then plug those in easily. Um, honestly, even with the scheduler, you could even go even more basic than that, than using the default scheduler, which is, is doing all this for you uh, and figuring out that supply and demand for you. Or you can even just within your pod spec, you can even just select, I want this to go to node one. <laughs> That's probably not a great idea. Uh, I, I can't really think of a really good instance where you might want to just specify the nodes uh, for your application because that node could go down and then that pod wouldn't be able to be scheduled anymore once that node goes down. But you do have that option uh, if you need it. You can have that basic level of scheduling, which is like, I'll just tell you which nodes to deploy on but it gives you an idea of the level of from super basic to super advanced of something that you uh, 
create yourself. All right, and next on to our cloud control manager. So this is really the, uh, this is a nice feature. And like when I was talking about taking that Udacity course that connected to Google Cloud, um, it'll use the cloud control manager uh, to deploy things uh, via the clouds, that cloud services API. So again, you only have this in the cloud, whether you're on AWS or Google, uh, Google Cloud or Azure. Um, so for example, you, you're not gonna have the ability to, to utilize this on-prem or for example, with Minikube. So you'll see later that um, with Minikube, we have to use kind of a slightly different command than you normally would in Kubernetes uh, to, to get a load balancer going, uh, to access like, the website that we're gonna deploy from be able to access from the outside world. Uh, we'll have to use a Minikube's kind of way of interacting and creating a load balancer. Whereas if you, you were on the cloud, you could actually use these cloud APIs that would automatically deploy a load balancer via those APIs. Okay, so let's take a second and talk about etcd. So etcd is a key values uh, consistent database. So it's actually a consistent, not eventually consistent. So if you're familiar with the CAP theorem, um, it chooses consistency over availability. So it stores all the activity on the cluster. So it combined with the API server uh, to def to actually perform the actions that you're gonna perform on the cluster. So it's all stored there. And the API server will um, use a watch API on etcd to do that monitoring to see what it needs to do next. So a request will come uh, and it'll get stored in etcd, uh, for example, like with a pod that needs three replicas. So that information will get stored there. The API server will be notified of this and it will check how many pods are running. And so it's gonna find in this, in our little example, it's gonna find that only two pods are running. It will then send a request to the scheduler uh, to schedule an additional pod to match the request. So it'll make sure that what's stored in etcd, which was that you know a pod needs three replicas, is then perpetuated out into the cluster. Okay, so uh, we've learned about the control plane, which each of these uh, components will be within the control plane. Um, and so we've kind of understand them, I think at the right amount of depth for, you know, getting our applications running on, uh, on Kubernetes. So, and, you know, honestly, it'll also be helpful to have that understanding of the control plane, even if you're an application developer, because um, it'll be helpful when you're like troubleshooting issues and trying to, you know, work with the teams to try to figure out you know, is it something wrong with my application or is it something wrong with the cluster, right? So let's dig into a bit uh, more about the node architecture here. Um, so there's three elements of the node architecture, the kubelet, the kube proxy, and the container runtime. So with the kubelet, there's gonna be one per node. You're gonna have a process or an agent that runs, like I said, on each Kubernetes node it uses pod specifications to understand which pods and containers should actually run. It monitors the pod for its, uh, that it's responsible for. So, right, it's only managing itself. It's one per node and it manages itself. And the control plane and the kubelet work very closely together. Now, this graphic's a little bit small, so I apologize for that. But you can see that the API server from the, the cube, uh, the control plane is interacting directly with those, with those kubelets. Uh, and then we have the kube proxy. So the kube proxy does all the network proxy that runs on each node, right? So we need to have a way for the nodes um, to be able to talk to each other, right? Because uh, we have a distributed system. How are we gonna have these nodes communicate, you know, between each other? So it's gonna use network rules to allow for that so that pods can talk to each other inside the cluster and other um, elements can come in from outside the cluster and talk to these nodes as well. So it also edits the IP table rules on uh, on each node. So from there we have the container runtime. So the containers live within uh, within the pods, and they package up our application. So the container runtime must be installed on each node. It doesn't just have to be Docker, but Do Docker is actually what we're going to use in our example. Um, but uh, you can also use Container D or Cryer Cryo. Those are other two uh, popular container runtimes. So like I said, so Kubernetes actually supports uh, multiple of those, not just Docker. 
All right, so let's let's start talking about more about what are what are workloads uh, and what are pods. So now we've kind of transitioned from the architecture of um, of Kubernetes, and and this is still uh, you know more high level topics, but this is getting into what we're actually going to be able to deploy in our hands on lab. So I've actually used this term with you now multiple times, and so I I apologize if I hadn't defined it previously. If you don't know what I'm talking about, but now you will. So. Um, what exactly is a pod? So pods are a group of one or more containers, which you can see in this graphic here. Uh, so each node is going to have uh, multiple pods scheduled on it. And within those pods, it'll either have one or several containers. In this example, you see it has two containers per pod. So most likely, um, the containers that you have within the pod and the whole idea is that those containers are actually working together uh, for your application. So they need to be grouped together in one pod so that they're easily portable and it's easy for them to communicate uh, within, you know, between each other. So for example, if you had a web application, you'd have a pod that's your front end service that's hosting, you know, that it's actually your static website or your, you know, your active website. And then you'd have another pod that's uh, maybe your backend database that's serving up that information to the static pod, or it's taking in transactions from maybe like a customer, you know, in an, in an interactive website, et cetera. So you would have those all within the same pod so that they easily communicate with each other. So why, why is this called a pod? Um, so a pod is actually a group of whales, as you can see in that photo there. Uh, and so as you, as you know, Docker, who coined the term, uh, their logo is a very cute whale. So then, of course, then uh, pods is for a group of whales, group of containers. All right. So again, more on what is a pod. So it's really the smallest unit within um, Kubernetes that's managed by Kubernetes. So any containers that are run outside of Kubernetes are not managed by Kubernetes. So you can, uh, if you don't do a, a cube cuddle, apply, you know, run pod, uh, that, that would be uh, managed by Kubernetes. But if you don't do that and you do a Docker, you know, Docker run of a Docker image, that will not be managed by Kubernetes. So it would still be up and running on your cluster, but not managed by Kubernetes. So you would not get all the benefits of the, you know, easily scalability, you know, and uh, and management of those pods or clusters or containers. So the pods are configured by a YAML file. So it will pull a container image from a source, uh, which you can kind of see here in this YAML file. And we're going to look more at YAML files here in a bit. So uh, don't worry about uh, too much about this graphic here. So the, again, like I said in the last slide, containers in a pod are always co-located. They will have a unique internal IP address per pod so that each pod knows how to communicate with the other one and interact with it. Containers talk to each other um, over, uh, pardon me, let me let me rephrase that. So each pod will have a unique ID uh, so that the pods can talk to each other over that unique IP and the other services. Then containers will talk to each other uh, via local host. Um, so the containers don't need that internal IP to be able to talk to each other. They'll just talk to each other via local host and ports. So all containers uh, within the pod use a common storage volume. So that's nice if you write out something uh, into a file from one container, another container can actually read that file um, into its, you know, into its application or whatever it's doing. So this is managed by the cube API and I say or the controller, but it's and the controller. It's a little typo there. So we'll take uh, an even better look at these YAML files uh, during the hands-on lab. Okay, so a little bit about controllers. So what is a controller? A controller is a control loop that manages the environment. It never terminates and continues to monitor the situation. So Cube Control Manager helps with managing each of these controller types. So the Control Manager oversees all the different other, other types of controllers. So it works on the current state and it gets you to the desired state. So if we have uh, two replicas and I want three, it helps you get that. So really think of a, a like of an, oven, an oven sensor. And there I have a picture of an easy bake oven. But so think about an oven. If you set it to a particular setting, like 350, right? 
and you want to wait until the oven is ready to put in your cookies, right? The sensors inside the oven that are checking the temperature um, and changing the state, either they need to add more heat because, um, you know, it hasn't, it's still trying to preheat the oven, so it's trying to get it up to the 350 degrees, uh, or it's going to notify you that the preheat is ready. It's going to send out a sensor that's going to then probably beep or turn off a light, et cetera. So these are control loops, right? They're just looping and continues to check state as they go. So Kubernetes has many controllers and even uh, custom controllers that you can write yourself. Uh, but we're just going to focus on the deployment controller in this particular example. So what is a deployment? Uh, so a deployment is a, um, it's a set of, it's a set of pods. Um, so it's a set of pods and um, the actions that you want to happen for those pods. So let me go here. So the deployment is setting a desired state for your pods. So things such as deleting and adding pods, those can all be added to your deployment. Adding a replica set, how many that you want. Do you want it to be restarted? Uh, so if your pod goes down, uh, do you not want it to be restarted? Or is it just a batch job that just runs once and once it quits, I don't want it to be restarted. These are all elements that you can put into your deployment spec. The ability to easily update and upgrade um, is there with uh, within the deployment. Okay, great. So we've had a bit of lecture. We have some understanding of the Kubernetes architecture. We have some understanding of the different elements that we're going to be working with within Kubernetes, such as pods and deployments and replica sets. And now it's time to get to our hands-on lab. So I would like everyone to go to this GitHub. So it's github.com slash Amanda Moran. And then you'll see you want to go to the open source summit uh, repo that I have there. And I'm going to share my screen for all of you. All right. And so here I am on the GitHub page. So it's, this tutorial is just going to be the nice, uh, it's a nice readme that we're going to go through. So the very first step that we need to take is that we actually need to install uh, Minikube. So I would like to give everyone just a few minutes. Uh, it doesn't take very long to install Minikube, uh, but I wanna give, I'm just gonna give everyone three minutes uh, to get Minikube installed or to get it you know, up and running uh, so that we can walk along with this together. So there's some really fantastic docs here on this page. Um, it has a really, like the Kubernetes docs, they're, if I haven't talked about them enough, uh, they're really fantastic. They're a really fantastic guide to installing um, Minikube. They're fantastic for just understanding the Kubernetes architecture and what you can do with it and you know helping guide you. Um, so I would strongly suggest taking a look at the Kubernetes docs after this talk. But for now, it's just gonna help us install Minikube. So I want everyone to click on that and then go and install Minikube. Um, you can install it on Linux, Mac, or Windows. Uh, and like I said before, a reminder, you will need a hypervisor installed uh, that might take some time. Minikube actually installs pretty quickly, but the hypervisor might take a little bit of time. So um, hopefully you've already done that. And um, like I said, personally, I use VirtualBox. I just find that the easiest. So I'm going to give everyone about um, three minutes to walk through those quick install Minikube, and then we'll get started here together. So I'm just going to click here on this just to show you all. So it's just going to, like I said, these are really intuitive docs. They're really nice. They give you installation instructions for Linux, Mac, and Windows. So it's really straightforward. So 
So don't worry about confirming the installation because we'll actually do that together. Hopefully everyone is finding it as easy to install as I did. And I will say, even though this, this way of virtual, virtually connecting with everyone and this wonderful conference is amazing, I do wish we were all there in person because it'd be so fun to just come around and meet you all and help you with this and you know us all learn from each other and work together. But without that, this is a, this is a good second. Okay, great. So um, hopefully you all have it now installed, or at least it's just about to install. Um, so we're going to get started here. So what I want to do, um, I'm actually not going to start my mini cube cluster because I already have one started. Um, actually, you know what? I'll just try to start it, see what happens. I think I'm going to get an error. So we want to do mini cube start. And then um, if you don't name your cluster, I think it just gives it the cluster name of default um, because you can have multiple uh, mini cube Kubernetes clusters running at one time. So I just called this final, like our, our talk, final frontier. And then uh, the default uh, VM driver is VirtualBox, um, last I checked. Um, I just like to be more specific and just make sure I just define it here that the VM driver is VirtualBox. I think for me, I had an issue once where I had tried to use VMware and it didn't really work for me in this particular case. And so then I had to go back and it got a little bit confused. So now I'm just more specific and it seems to all go just fine. Okay, so actually it's not throwing an error, which is cool. So it must just be starting just afresh. So if I do the start here, it's gonna download some uh, packages. It's gonna, you know, get an IP address for us. It's gonna configure Docker to make sure we have that as our runtime. And it's gonna make sure it launches and awesome. Okay, so kubectl is now configured to use final. So right, um, the command line tool, right, you need to make sure that it's pointing to the cluster that you want it to be pointing to, right? Because your kubectl could be pointing to uh, your mini cube instance, um, in this particular case, we want to make sure it's connected to final and not default, right? If, or, or any other cluster that we started, we also want to make sure it doesn't connect to, you know, maybe our production cluster as well, right? Cause we don't want to be doing anything like, you know, delete services or delete namespaces to de delete deployments on our, our, uh, production cluster, right? Okay, great. So we're all started. So now let's just do it. If you see here in the tutorial, we can do a mini cube status. Okay, wonderful. So we see our host is up and running, our kubelet is up and running, our API server, you know, all these different elements that we talked about before is up and running. And our kubectl is uh, correctly configured and it's pointing to our mini cube instance on this IP. So that is wonderful. So if we were on a proper Kubernetes uh, cluster and not mini cube, we could actually use this command here. So kubectl get component statuses. So in this particular case, because we're on Minikube, it, this, this command doesn't work, but I did want to show you it just so that you could use it on a Kubernetes cluster. So, right, it's letting us know about our scheduler, our control manager, and etcd. And in this particular case, just because we're not using a proper Kubernetes um, cluster, we're just using Minikube, it doesn't show up, but it's a good command to know. Okay, so let's go through and create our first pod. So we want to run this command here and I'll walk through it here. Let me just quickly copy it. I'm going to clear my screen here. Okay. So we're going to use a cube cuddle and we're going to run and we're going to call our pod or our pod. Hello. So, um, run is a command that you can use only with pods. Um, we're going to call it hello. And then we're going to use dash dash image equals a Morano six, which is my, uh, public, Docker uh, repository that you can pull from. 
and then we're going to pull uh, an image called Hello Friends. So go ahead and hit enter. And so quickly you see that uh, pod slash hello has been created. Now yours may take a tiny bit more time just because you have to pull that image afresh uh, where I already have it already pulled uh, and cached, uh, but it shouldn't take very long at all. So this is gonna be a simple container that's printing out a message to all my new friends here at the Open Source Summit. Uh, but when I deployed my container, um, I didn't get any kind of message. So let's just make sure that our pod is up and running. So cube control or cube cuddle get pods. Okay, great. So my pod name, hello, uh, it's actually, uh, it's creating now. Um, and it's about 35 seconds old. And I can just keep making sure that it's okay. Right. So I, my, my pod has been created and now it's, it's, it's completed. So let's take a look at our log file. So we can do a cube control logs on our pod named hello. Awesome. And we see uh, what that pod was doing, which was outputting a message to the log files. And it says, hello, open source summit. I'm so happy to be teaching you the basics of Kubernetes and live long and prosper. Awesome. So we were able to get our first pod up and running on our um, Kubernetes cluster. And also what we can do now is we can do a cube control, delete pods, and then hello. And that'll actually delete that pod since we're done using it. So it's nice to get everything all nice and cleaned up. All right, so let's get into deploying a website. Okay, just wanna check and make sure everything's going good there. Okay, so um, we need to create, very first and foremost, we need to create a YAML file. So that's a configuration file that I've been talking about uh, here, and it's a YAML file. So how we're gonna create that, and let me copy this command and then we'll walk through the command. So I'm gonna clear my screen, copy this. Okay, so we're gonna do a cube cuddle. We're gonna create a deployment and that deployment is going to be named web app. So in this particular case, we're not creating just a pod, we're creating a deployment, right? And a deployment host is, you know, uh, lets you know, like we talked about before, it has, it may have multiple pods, replicas, restart strategy, etc. We're gonna pull an image called Amanda06 slash Picard tips. And then here's how we're gonna create the YAML file. And this is really the key to creating, uh, not just creating that deployment and it running automatically. And instead we're gonna just create the YAML file and it won't be run yet. So we're gonna do dash dash dry run equals client. So just run a dry run of this on the client, which is you know what we're doing here, dash O YAML. And then we're gonna uh, you know put that, uh, pipe that into a file called web app dab webapp.yaml. Okay, so then let's just take a, uh, I use Vim, I love Vim. So let's do it on our web app YAML and take a look here inside. So let's just double check that it looks like what we have here in our example, which it does, which is great. So we see our API version, the kind. So in this particular case, if we had done the same um, same command with running that hello pod, instead of deployment, we would see a pod. Uh, we're gonna see some metadata. We're gonna see the labels on our deployment. In this particular case is called web app. Uh, then we're gonna get into the spec. We're gonna see our replicas. Again, we're gonna see more around our labels. We're gonna see our template, um, again, with some more labels. And then we're gonna see uh, another spec around our container spec. We're gonna see the image that we're gonna pull, which is a Morano 6 slash Picard tips and the name of that container. So our deployment is gonna have a different name than our container names, right? So our deployment is called web app and our container is called Picard tips. So I'm gonna keep this open, but then we actually need to edit this YAML file. So in the next step, we're gonna add a container port to our YAML configuration file. So this is a really important step as our app, as our web app we've created, um, is running on port uh, 5000, and we need to make sure that is exposed to Kubernetes. So if you see here in the example, we're gonna come down to our container, because we that's where we need to expose the port, and we're gonna add ports, and then dash, 
container ports. I'm just going to move this to the side to make sure that I do it right. So YAML is very picky about um, indentation and um, all those things. So you have to make sure that you get it get it right. <laughs> so that's why I like to just copy it just directly so I'm not trying to remember it and then getting it wrong. So we're going to add ports dash space container port and then we're going to put 5000 that's going to expose the port then i'm going to save my file okay wonderful so i've created my yaml file i've edited it to add that container port and expose it and now i'm actually let's go ahead and just get that started okay so now that we've generated the yaml we're going to do a cube control apply dash f so for file right and then web app dot yaml so we should see deployment dot apps slash web app has been created so if i do a cube control get deployments i should see web app uh, up and running wonderful and if i do a cube control get pods I should also see a pod that's been created, right? Because deployment is a wrapper around our pod. So I also see a pod and it's up and running, which is wonderful. Okay. So next thing that we need to do, so that's not all, right? Because now that our website's up and running, we actually want to be able to uh, expose it to the outside world so that folks can actually, you know, look at our website, right? So we're going to need to expose, expose our deployment to the outside world by using a load balancer. So, um, We'll need to get this. We'll need to actually have an external IP so that we can actually, you know, come onto that website uh, with the uh, in combination with the the port eighty eighty. So this is the command that we're going to use to do that. Let me copy that. So let me just walk through this a bit. So we're going to do a cube control expose our deployment web app. So that's the name of our deployment. Of de we want of type load balancer of port 8080 and target port, which is the port of our container that's been exposed, which is 5000. So we're going to run that there. So we should see that exposed. So if I do a cube control get service, services or service, services. Wonderful. You can see that my web app now has a load balancer. And so in this particular case, it has not been granted an external IP. That's because we're on Minikube. And so um, we will then, that's what we have to do next. Uh, so let's also, like, like I said, we can also do a, let me clear this, cube control, get pods, comma, services. We can also see our services and our pods. Okay, so now since that we are on Minikube, we actually need it to create that load balancer for us because we're not on a, uh, you know, a managed service uh, that can then deploy a load balancer or we're on our, you know, something that's managed for us that already has a load balancer. We're going to need to create that with Minikube. So it's a really cool service. So you do Minikube service web app. We're going to run that. And hopefully that should pop up, should pop up our web page. Let's see. And it's live demo, everyone. Let's pause there. Okay, so in the past, <laughs> when I run this, what should happen is actually my browser should pop up. Uh, it'll automatically grant an external IP. It should pop up and then there should be the web page. Now for some reason, let's, let's do a Let's see if maybe I already have one running. Maybe that's why it didn't pop up. Let's see. Little live troubleshooting is always fun. Uh, 
Okay, I think those are those the ones I just started. So let's try it again. Okay. Well, it's thinking about it. Okay. Well, let's kill this for now. Let me just take another quick look here. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, what should happen? And hopefully it's happening for you because something's funky on my machine right now. But what you should see pop up in your local browser is a static web page with all these awesome Picard tips. So it's just a static web page. It'll have awesome Picard web tips. Uh, that it's actually a Twitter handle that tweets these just about every day uh, of these different management tips from, you know, like it would be from a Jean-Luc Picard. So, right, here's a great one. The respect you show your crew is a major factor in determining how you feel about their work. Um, so it's always good tips. I read it just about every day. And I'm very disappointed that my web app is not popping up, but hopefully yours is. And that's what happens with live demos. Okay, so let's move on here. Uh, to creating a highly available application. So if we do a cube control get pods, we'll see that we only have one web app pod that's been created. We saw that already. So let's say our Picard management tip site starts getting a lot of traffic, it's super popular. How are we gonna scale up and make sure that we have a highly available app? So that's where pod replication comes into play. So let's open back up our YAML file. Okay, and that's where we're going to come back to this replicas, right? So what we want to do, and mind you, um, this is not the only way to add replicas. There's actually a command line way to add it, uh, but I just kind of wanted to show you just a few things here. So what we're going to do is we're actually just going to edit our YAML file to have three replicas, and we're going to save it. And then let's just take a look at our pods. Okay, so we see we still have one pod. Okay, well, actually, right, that makes sense because we haven't actually applied this new YAML file. So if we had, ex you might've been expecting to see three that it'll just pick it up automatically, but it won't. So what I want us to do is we're gonna do a cube control delete, let's see, make sure I get it right. Delete deploy. Web app. And then delete service web app, because that's that service that we created when we exposed for the load balancer. Okay, so if we do a get pods and services, we'll see that they're terminating. Okay, great. So now we need to do another cube control apply dash F in our web app YAML. Okay, it should be created. So let's take a look. Awesome. So now you should see we have one pod that's terminating, right? It should be gone here in just a, f just a few minutes. Yeah, there it's gone. And now when you do a good pods, you're gonna see that we actually have three pods that um, are up and running. And another thing, so I wanna show you, so if I do a cube control, delete pods, and I take one of the names of these pods, and I delete it, I take a second here, so by the time this deletes and we do a get pause, we're either going to see, we may see a couple of things. So let's give it a second and then see what we see. Kind of taking a long while to delete. Okay, there we go. So as you can see here, if you look at the age, so automatically what it did is even though that, that pod got deleted, it automatically scaled up another pod. Uh, and that's, I mean, honestly, that's one of the many features and the powers of Kubernetes, right? You didn't have to do anything. It got deleted and then automatically it's up and running. You know, there's very little downtime for your users. So let's try to add our service again for our deployment. And let's try Minikube service web app again. Let me see if it'll launch. I would really love if it did that. Okay. 
I would love that so much. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, that's something for, if it's happening to you, that's something really fun to go and debug. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it's not, but hopefully it's working for you. It was working for me in the past. Not quite sure where it's working for me. Not working for me right now. Okay. So we went through this verifying that the replicas work as intended. We got our pods. We deleted a pod and then we got our pods again. And we would have, we might have seen a couple of things. We might have seen one terminating and then one starting, or we might have just like we saw they were all running, but then with different times uh, since they had been active, right? So just as a recap, so uh, let's just recap what we've learned in this tutorial. So we've learned how to install a local instance of Kubernetes with Minikube. We've learned how to run a pod from a Docker image. We've learned how to create uh, a deployment and run a deployment, create a service, run a load balancer with Minikube and make that service highly available with replicas. We've boldly gone where no one has gone before, except, okay, well, maybe many people have gone before, but we all learned something new, which is awesome. So I wanna give some credit here uh, to the wonderful uh, Kubernetes tutorial docs and also the wonderful Docker uh, curriculum docs as well. Um, I'm not a web developer, so I mean, if you could see my little website, um, I actually got that code um, from the developers over at Docker uh, Curriculum. Um, so they had a similar app and I just kind of tweaked it to be hard tips. Theirs originally was uh, cat cat GIFs. Uh, so there's probably a little bit more fun. So it was really a lifesaver. So I didn't have to figure out how to write a web app all on my own. So uh, thanks to them. That was awesome. Alrighty. So, you know, now that we've kind of, we've gone through our hands-on tutorial, we have, uh, we've learned about Kubernetes, why you should use it, why it's important, the architecture, um, but, you know, you really need to continue learning because this was only just, you know, a little more than, you know, an hour and a half and uh, definitely need to continue learning. So I would highly recommend reading the Kubernetes docs. They are excellent, very clear. The folks who work on those work very hard because I, uh, I help a lot with documentation, you know, in my various places I have worked and it's, uh, it is a challenging job. So uh, they work really hard on that. And so I appreciate that. Uh, also the link to the Udacity course, it is a free course, uh, introducing uh, scalable microservices and Kubernetes. It's really great. Probably takes around six hours or so to get through, uh, really good information. Uh, another great book is Kubernetes in Action. Uh, I've started reading that, um, almost done. Uh, and it's really good, uh, very dense, you know, good information it has like just about everything you need to know. Uh, then I would also recommend a Linux foundation training. They have an introduction to Kubernetes. It's also free. Um, you do, if you want to get uh, certified on the, or uh, get a certificate, I should say for introduction to Kubernetes, uh, I think you do have to pay a small fee, but the class itself is totally free and really great. Also, like I've kind of mentioned uh, previously, you know, become a part of the Kubernetes community, right? Join a meetup, uh, head over there and just learn more from the folks that are there and, and the other folks there to just chat with, you know, make a pull request, uh, keep attending conferences, keep learning um, about Kubernetes and other distributed systems and other things by the, you know, the Linux Foundation. Uh, it's really great. Um, you know, answer questions, um, you know, on different forums or Slack Overflow, things like that on the mailing list. You know, if somebody has a question, you know, that you know the answer to, jump in, you know, and, and help out. It's really appreciated. Um, help contribute to the docs, right? That's always uh, highly encouraged. It's not just code, right? There's other things that you can do to contribute and become a part of the community. And really everyone is welcome. So uh, nothing is too big or too small to be a part of this community. And so there's just some references from my talk today. And I just wanna thank you all so much uh, for coming to my tutorial. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, but I hope it's also just the beginning of your journey. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm, uh, I'll am i be here uh, in real life to answer some of your questions. Thank you. All right, there's a little lag on the video. Uh, but I think it's all okay. But yes, so that was a recording that I did and now you're, you're hearing me live. Um, so a lot of you asked, um, 
uh, well, you commented about the the bug at the end of the tutorial, and um, you are absolutely correct. So um, what I have in the README is correct. Um, I needed the dash the, the dash p final because we started up a cluster uh, called final. So we need to when we run our commands, we need to make sure because I can have many Kubernetes uh, mini cube clusters running at the same time. So I need to make sure. Okay, hopefully y'all can hear me. Um, I wanted to double check that you could, and I'm unmuted, okay. Um, but like I said, you can have many Kubernetes clusters running uh, on your Minikube uh, at the same time. So when you run a Minikube command, you need to specify um, which one that you're connecting to and which one you wanna run the command on. And my brain forgot about that during the recording. <laughs> and so uh, I wasn't able to get that pulled up, but hopefully you all were. And then I have the correct instructions in the README. Um, so I wanted to go through, it looks like you all have some questions here. So let me just scroll through. Uh, there's some comments now. Yeah, there's a couple of comments about, um, you know, maybe Minikube not working for you or um, it not working on various platforms. Um, sorry, that's kind of a bummer. It's always a bummer, you know, when you're doing like installation type things. Uh, during a tutorial because everybody's computer is different. Everybody's laptop is different. It always seems like never quite runs smoothly for all. So hopefully a majority of you were able to do it. If you weren't, um, apologies. Um, you know, hopefully at least you're able to follow along. Uh, and then maybe once you're, you know, maybe on your personal laptop or something like that, you could run it and, and it'll be pretty straightforward. Okay. Let's see. Ah, someone, uh, someone asked, okay, this is a good question. Uh, Minikube equals cube control. Um, are, are they equivalent? N no. So Minikube is just a nice way of running a Kubernetes cluster on your laptop. It's just like a local installation of Kubernetes, right? I think earlier in the talk I mentioned uh, when I took a Udacity course, they used a uh, Google Cloud platform, right? And they used, what's it, EK... EKG, AKS, I never remember the acronym, doesn't matter. It's a Google managed Kubernetes service. Um, and so from there you could use that and then you would use, you know, you would basically set up the tutorial exactly the same way, except nothing with regards to Minikube. Minikube's just running the Kubernetes infrastructure for you. Um, so you would run different commands for Minikube, like Minikube start is actually start my Kubernetes cluster. And then kube control run is actually start a pod on that Kubernetes cluster. So hopefully that's a little bit more clear. It's not, it's not as crystal clear here because we're setting up that Kubernetes instance on our laptop as opposed to like connecting to uh, an exter external Kubernetes, you know, cluster where it would be much more obvious. So it is a little bit, a little bit confusing here, but um, once you kind of get the hang of it, it's, it's a little bit more uh, easy to understand. Oh, somebody mentioned I've ever had a typo somewhere. Totally, I always have typos. <laughs> um, oh, why is it necessary to delete the deploy and the service? Oh, I was able to run kube control apply dash F with replicas three in the ML file and get three replicas. Yep, you can do it that way as well. Um, you can you can create your YAML file and edit the uh, number of replicas and run it from there. Um, you don't necessarily have to delete um, delete anything to do that. Uh, I was just kind of showing, you know, like how you can clean up and then do it. Um, there's also another command that I didn't go into here that you could look up. Um, you wouldn't even need to edit your YAML file. You would just be able to run a kube control. Can't remember the exact command off the top of my head, but nevertheless, there's a kube control command where you can just, I think it's edit, edit replica or something like that. And then you can edit the replicas just there on the fly and it'll deploy uh, additional replicas. Good question. Could you share the repository used for the tutorial? And um, so, yeah, so that's under my GitHub. So if you go to GitHub and then you go to Amanda, and I think it's also on the um, the conference website as well. But if you go to GitHub and then Amanda Moran, A-M-A-N-D-A-M-O-R-A-N, and then you should find a folder that's open source summit and click on that. And then you'll see that the Kubernetes final frontier, because actually I have another talk tomorrow where I'll have some slides posted in that repository as well. So you'll see two uh, folders, one for Kubernetes Final Frontier and the other for a database talk I have tomorrow. And then uh, and then from there you click in there, you can find it. Okay. 
Let's see. Oh, someone said thank you. You're very welcome. Someone says the demo worked for them. Hooray. <laughs> uh, where can we get the slides? Um, you can actually get them in the GitHub uh, repository as well. I will be posting them there. I generally post a PDF of my slide decks uh, in my GitHub repository as well. There may be also a way that that um, that the conference is sharing them as well. And so there would be that as available as well. But you could also pick up a PDF from my GitHub. Uh, I should actually post that probably just right after I get off this, this uh, conference. I, that's a good question. I'm not quite sure. Oh, sorry, someone asked about uh, finding the video. Uh, I'm sure it'll be posted. Um, I'm not quite sure where at this time, but I'm sure they'll have like follow any emails where um, the conference organizers let us all know all that information. Okay, someone else figured out my recording bug where I couldn't get it installed. Okay. Oh, good question about um, would you, okay, so if you want to run a database and you want to have it running on Kubernetes, would you, I suggest running a database container in each of the pods or would you rather use a central database pod for them all? Um, that's an interesting question um, that you definitely want to, yeah, it depends on which type of database you're using. It depends on how you're going to be syncing that data. Um, so I would do, I would do a lot more investigation around that and what exactly kind of database you're using. Uh, think about there's, um, some really good tutorials out there on, uh, Cassandra and Kubernetes. I would definitely advise, um, uh, Googling that. Actually, some of my former colleagues, uh, have been working really hard on that. Um, so I would look into that. That would kind of help you on figuring that out. Um, even if you're not using, um, Cassandra per se, because maybe you don't need like a NoSQL database. Um, that'll kind of help guide you on, on the architecture of, of defining that. But yeah, I've definitely researched more into that. Okay. Oh, someone, oh, GKE is Google Kubernetes engine. Good job. Good find. Oh, someone asked about the alternatives to Minikube. Um, I would look on the, um, the alternatives of Minikube. I don't know that there's anything else that you could run that I'm aware with, aware of that you can run locally on your laptop. Um, it's pretty easy to deploy uh, a Kubernetes instance in the cloud. Um, now, of course, that costs money, whereas just running something on your laptop costs no money. <laughs> um, but even if, I mean, like most of us can get credits and things like that. So if you're just running it for, you know, like for example, this tutorial takes like 30 minutes, it, it wouldn't take that many credits. So it's something you can consider um, if you can't get it running on your laptop that you could just use something in the cloud with credits, that is. Oh, somebody mentioned um, they might've had an issue with the demo because um, I didn't mention installing Cube Control or Cube Cuddle. Um, my understanding, that's a good question um, and a good observation. I assumed it came with Minikube, that it just got it, it downloaded it for you. Um, that was my assumption. Now, I already, obviously, I already have it installed on my laptop, so it'd be real easy for me to not know uh, if it came with Minikube or not. I thought it came with it. Um, if it didn't, then yes, that is a bug <laughs> that I would need to make sure that folks knew that they need to install Cube Control. So that's a good find. A uh, question about Minikube having the controller and nodes um, all in one. Um, yeah, so it's just basically running just everything locally on your laptop. That's a good question. How does Cube Control know how to connect to the Minikube cluster instead of, for example, your production cluster? Um, yeah, so when you do that, uh, that's a very good question. And actually one I was just dealing with the other day. When you do that mini cube start, it actually is going to write to your uh, .cube slash config file. 
and point to the mini cube cluster. It's basically going to put that there first. And so that's where it's going to have, when you do a cube control, it's going to point to that mini cube cluster first. So then what you'll need to do to connect to your production cluster, um, I'm not quite, because everyone does that a little bit differently. Um, yeah, I would make sure that the near cube config file has it as well, and that you might need to do some kind of uh, startup or in it or something like that, that uh, to reconnect to your production one. Good question. Good question. Why does Kubernetes need a hypervisor? Kubernetes in itself, a very good question, does not need a hypervisor. Um, when you have a Kubernetes cluster that you've installed, you know, um, in the cloud or, you know, on prem, um, you don't need a uh, virtual box or VMware or anything like that. Um, but for just the, the mini cube, it needs that. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Excellent question. Can Corgis get into Disneyland? No. That's so sad. <laughs> good question though. Oh, good. Yeah, good comment here. Docker desktop is an alternative to Minikube. Yeah, great observation. All right. Well, thank you all. That was fun. Good questions. Um, yeah, I hope that was helpful. I hope that was, a, you know, a good introduction. I know I know it's just an introduction, right? Um, there's a lot more to cover. Um, so yeah, I hope that was helpful. Hope you enjoyed the tutorial. Hope there weren't too many bugs along the way. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.